wanted to read to you uh, from Valtorta an experience, how she describes uh, Jesus's dark nights. She speaks about him in Gethsemane. Gethsemane, it, it has some of the most profound depictions of his sufferings, of Valtorta's depictions of the agony in Gethsemane. Um, I was once praying and I asked the Lord in my prayer, how can I have a prayer that is um, that is more personal, that is more intimate? Um, and the answer that I felt that the Lord gave me was pray in places where I suffered. Come and join me in places where I suffered to enter places where he endured the most horror. So there's something powerful about mentally, mentally meditating on Gethsemane, mentally meditating on being there, mentally meditating, of course, on Calvary. So here's how Valtorta describes his agony in Gethsemane. He remains for some time. Then he utters a stifled cry and raises his face, looking very upset, only for a moment. Then he drops on the ground with his face really on the earth and remains thus, a worn out man overburdened by all the sins of the world, struck by all the justice of the Father, oppressed by the darkness, the ashes, the bitterness by the tremendous, terrible, most dreadful thing that is the abandonment by God while Satan torments us. It is the asphyxia of the soul. It is to be buried alive in this prison that is the world when we can no longer feel any tie between us and God. It is to be chained gagged, stoned by our very prayers, which fall back on us bristling with sharp points and spread with fire. It is to be, it is to butt against a closed heaven, which neither the voice nor the appearance of our anguish can penetrate. It is to be the orphans of God. It is madness, agony, the doubt of having been deceived so far, it is the persuasion of being rejected by God, of being damned. It is hell. Powerful. Powerful. Notice how she tries to capture this feeling, and the Lord allows her to feel it in order to be able to capture it of the darkest of nights. It is the abandonment by God while Satan torments us. It feels it feels like you are cha you are chained, gagged. It is madness. It is agony. It is the feeling that we've been deceived so far. It is the persuasion of being rejected by God, of being damned. And what a lot of this is, notice that she describes it so well. It's the overburden of all the sins of the world. So basically, basically, Jesus had to take upon himself the sins of the world. What that also included is a feeling that is similar to what a person feels like when they're in a state of mortal sin. They may feel far from God's they may feel like their God is disgusted by them, has rejected them. And Jesus, of course, never sinned, but there would have to be a feeling that is analogous when you take the sins of the world upon yourself. It is also something that, um, that's present in terms of the temptation. Uh, the, the temptation... Um, that Satan was present in Gethsemane. One of the things that Valtorta's revelations reveal is that heaven was closed, so to speak, on this night, Holy Thursday, 
after the institution of the Eucharist, after the greatest miracle, when they went to pray in Gethsemane, that it was a dark night where there were more demons roaming the earth than guardian angels, where it felt like prayers that were lifted up to heaven were being shut, shut off, where there was a heaviness that permeated, temptations that permeated, demons roaming the earth to tempt human beings uh, towards the murder of God, towards the murder of Jesus and that each apostle had his demon by his side and that Christ and Judas, who were the main characters of this drama, each had Lucifer by his side. And that one of the greatest temptations, some of the greatest temptations that um, Lucifer gave Jesus in Gethsemane included uh, the temptation of showing him the millions of people who would exist throughout the centuries for whom your passion means nothing, for whom your suffering means nothing. Why do this? Why go through all this pain? And he showed him the pain of the passion with a hyper realism, with an unsurpassable realism, Christ says. Notice how Satan and his temptation plays into the ingratitude of men, the ingratitude of humanity. And this is something that Our Lady would emphasize in Fatima and other apparitions. She would say, my dear children, make reparations. Make reparations because of the blasphemies and ingratitudes of men because of the sufferings that my son's heart experiences because of the blasphemy and ingratitude of men and that ingratitude is often towards his passion you know even even this sunday right uh or next week uh is going to be of course easter sunday i look forward to it because i will be celebrating mass at a parish and preaching and i look forward to it because of course the church is going to be packed it is going to be packed because there will be souls there who come to mass twice a year christmas and easter right what an opportunity what an opportunity to preach to these souls what an opportunity to reach these souls you need to find such a balance such as sensitivity on the one hand you want to convey harsh truths right harsh truths that he died for you on the cross and he deserves every sunday it's one hour a week for pete's sakes how weak are we in our love on the other hand you know that human beings are hypersensitive and sometimes if you give them too much of the truth it scares them so you need to find a balance but Ingratitude is expressed in so many ways. Sometimes it is the superficiality of treating the Eucharist, treating the Mass, treating it like something that is not that important, that doesn't have great value. It, it should be the center. It should be the absolute center of our spiritual lives. It should be not only a weekly weekly obligation and even that word obligation you know i don't like it i mean obviously yes yeah, sunday mass is an obligation you commit mortal sin if you do not attend but even if we treat it under that mentality of obligation um it will be it will be something that is a rudimentary spirituality my mass should not be obligation my mass should be intimacy my mass should not be obligation. My mass should be an expression of love for the crucified one. My mass should be a joy to say that I'm going to encounter Jesus at the altar, to say that I'm going to encounter Our Lady, the angels and the saints surrounding the altar of God where heaven intersects with, with earth, with our humanity. In the ingratitude of humanity that Satan shows Jesus in Gethsemane, so many, so many for whom your passion means nothing. Why go through this? 
he also uses an extremely insidious temptation extremely insidious you know what other temptation he uses the evil one he uses our mother he uses the mother of god he uses our lady by appealing to natural human sensitivities he uses her and he says think of your mother why why must she experience this suffering why must she see you suffer this way think of having a long life a long life where you can live for many years and live for your mother and you don't need to die like this and then you know what the devil said in gethsemane according to valtorta he said and i will help you with my angels i will help you to bring many souls to god with a long life and of course what that temptation does is it tries to steer away from the sacrifice the sacrifice that reconciles the world with God. what that temptation does it also elevates natural considerations over supernatural considerations and sometimes we need to be careful about these realities in our own lives you know sometimes families may not feel crazy about their child leaving for religious life. Maybe families have a daughter who wants to become a religious sister. Maybe one. Maybe you have a daughter who wants to become a cloistered nun. Maybe the Lord's calling her to such an immense, intimate sacrifice of love. And there may be natural considerations that say, you know, why would you leave the family, you know? and. We need to consider the supernatural considerations. We need to consider supernatural vocations. When I first entered religious life, my first week, I experienced some of the most intense spiritual attacks. It felt like half of hell was released that week to accompany me to religious life. <laughs> it was so bad. Every night, I experienced demonic nightmares every night every day i experience this immense heaviness having no desire to stay no attraction towards religious life it all left that first week and i missed my family so intensely like never before i called my mother i i said to her how much i missed them you know what my mom did being a good mom she laughed <laughs> she laughed. She said, you miss us? We're like the most dysfunctional family in the world. You never miss us. And that's when I realized she's right. <laughs> she's right. I've done graduate school. I've been out of town for so long. I never have this experience of this yearning or missing or seldom, I should say. And of course, sometimes that's how you notice that there's an extra spiritual attack. You feel something differently. And of course, the heaviness, the demonic nightmares. I basically had to spend a lot of time in the chapel, a lot of time in prayer. Uh, eventually the heaviness left because the demons hate being in the presence of the blessed sacrament so they'll leave you alone if you spend a lot of time there and you know it was just interesting because what the temptation was or part of the temptation was your family you're away from them this is so difficult they must miss you so much you miss them so much why are you doing this why are you causing them this pain so it's a temptation that emphasizes natural familial connections over supernatural considerations over supernatural vocation and that's what the devil was trying to do here as well in the garden against jesus i wanted to read uh, the passage that i always read um or, or i should say i often read to parishioners to students sometimes homilies because I think it's one of the most beautiful passages ever written, most beautiful passage I have ever seen. It's um, it's a passage in Valtorta where the Lord is suffering intensely in Gethsemane to the point that he is sweating blood. I once I once heard a uh, person with a, a scientific background 
in the natural sciences who went to Johns Hopkins Medical School uh, say to me that a, it is a scientifically proven fact that a human being undergoing unbearable stress can actually sweat blood. It can happen. And that it's simply a sign of undergoing a trauma and anxiety that feels so overwhelming that it is too much to handle and that this phenomena can transpire. Um, and it's interesting because I wonder also whether there could be a stigmatic precursor here to the crown of thorns that the Lord will put, put on the next day as well. So Jesus, enduring this horror, sweats blood. And now there's passages here in Valtorta where Jesus emphasizes Satan's temptation in Gethsemane. And one of the biggest temptations was showing me my abandonment by God, that the Lord Jesus had to experience this intense abandonment from God the Father, the feeling of abandonment, because God never actually abandons us, but um, the feeling as if God doesn't love you, as if God has abandoned you, as if God doesn't care that this was a satanic temptation. So let me read these words, powerful words. He showed me, Satan showed me, my abandonment by God. He, the Father, no longer loved me. I was laden with the sins of the world. I disgusted him. He was absent and was leaving me to myself and was surrendering me to the mockery of a cruel crowd. And he would not even grant me his divine comfort. I was alone, all alone. In that hour, there was but Satan near the Christ. God and man were absent because they did not love me. They hated me or were uninterested. I prayed to cover the satanic words with my prayers, but my prayer no longer ascended to God. It fell back on me like stones of lapidation and crushed me under its rubble. My prayer that had always been for me like a caress given to the Father, a voice that ascended and was answered by a fatherly caress and words, was now dead, heavy, uttered in vain to a closed heaven. Okay, so consider this temptation. Notice how Jesus says um, that Satan showed me my abandonment by God the Father. He, the Father, no longer loved me. I disgusted him. I was laden with the sins of the world. Notice how it's a temptation that can relate to how we often feel, especially since Jesus has taken the sins of the world upon himself. And if you've ever been in mortal sin, you know what it feels like to feel that God is disgusted by you, even if that's not the fact, because there's a difference between how we feel and the actual spiritual reality. God is infinite love, and he doesn't abandon his children even when they're in darkness. Um, but that's the feeling, the feeling of abandonment. I was alone, all alone. And notice how he says that God and man were absent. They hated me or were uninterested. Then the Lord says, I prayed to cover the satanic words with my prayers. So there's a recognition here that these are satanic words. This is all a temptation. This sense that God has abandoned me. This sense that the Father no longer loves me. This sense that I disgust him. This is all a satanic temptation. Jesus continues, I then tasted the bitterness of the bottom of the cup, the flavor of despair. It was what Satan wanted to lead me to despair to make me a slave. I overcame despair and I overcame it only with my power because I wanted to defeat it. Only with my strength of a man, I was nothing but a man in that moment, no longer helped by God. 
when God helps you, it is easy to lift even the world and hold it up like a child's toy. But when God does not help us anymore, even the weight of a flower is a burden to us. So this emphasis that Jesus had to undergo the passion without, his, without the comfort of his divine nature, feeling only the presence of his human nature, so that immense desolation, that immense darkness, that sense of the void of God's presence. He continues, I defeated despair and Satan, its creator, in order to serve God and you by giving you the life. But I became acquainted with death, with a broken heart and blood pouring out in a trauma of an effort exceeding all endurance. And I sweated blood. I sweated blood to be faithful to God's will. Now Jesus will emphasize something so powerful here, so powerful. There is one gospel from the four gospels. It is the gospel of Luke, which stresses that in the midst of his agony, when Jesus had nothing else to give, when he feels like the weight of the world, and it literally is on his shoulders, spiritually speaking, when he's sweating blood, an angel of light came to him, according to the Gospel of Luke. An angel of light came to him to comfort him from heaven, to offer some drop of consolation. So the question becomes, what did the angel of light show him? Here's what he says. That is why I, I sweated blood to be faithful to God's will. That is why the angel of my sorrow showed me the hopes of all those who have been saved through my sacrifice as a medicine for my dying. Your names, each name was a drop of medicine instilled into my veins to invigorate them and make them function. Each of them was for me life coming back, light coming back, strength coming back. During the cruel tortures to avoid shouting my grief of man and in order not to despair of God and say that he was too severe and unjust to his victim, I repeated your names to myself. I saw you. Since then, I blessed you. Since then, I have carried you in my heart. And when the time came for you to be on the earth, I leaned out of heaven to accompany your coming, rejoicing at the thought that a fresh flower of love was born in the world and would have lived for me. Oh, my blessed ones, the comfort of the dying Christ, my mother, John, the disciple, the pious woman, were present at my death, and you were there as well. My dying eyes saw with the tormented face of my mother, also your loving ones, and they closed thus, happy to be closed, because they had saved you, you who deserve the sacrifice of a God. beautiful words with beautiful stunning words your names the angel of light in the midst of the agony when jesus had nothing else to give and it was overwhelming and he's sweating blood and he feels like he cannot continue the angel of light show, showed me your names i saw you and since that day, I blessed you. And since that day, I could not wait for your coming into the world when I would greet you. Notice how in that moment, the Lord Jesus probably saw the face. He said, I saw the face of Joan of Arc, of Gemma Galgani, of Teresa of Lisieux, of Francis of Assisi, of John Paul II, and of you dear brother and sister, he saw your face. Notice how it's a contradistinction between the temptation of Satan, 
the temptation of Satan was showing him the millions of people for whom your passion means nothing. Why are you doing this? But the angel of light showed him the holy inversion. All those souls who will be born one day, who will live for you, Lord Jesus, who will love you, for whom your sacrifice means everything. Their names were offered, their faces were offered, your names, your faces, like medicine for my veins, he said, invigorating me. How beautiful, how profound. Next time, or this time, this time, this week, this holy week, when you're contemplating his sufferings in Gethsemane, consider, dear soul, consider, dear soul, that he saw you. He saw you, the angel of light showed him your name, showed him your face, and that gave him the incentive to continue. Your face, your name was a consolation to him. And yes, yes, console him, console our crucified Jesus this week. And you know what else Valtorta's revelations revealed? This was so beautiful. Previously mentioned how heaven was closed this night you know demons roamed the earth on this night it's like the angels were less present prayers that were lifted up were not, not really feeling like they were being answered right heaven was closed so to speak but why did that angel of light come down how could that angel of light come down um according to valtorta's revelations jesus says because my holy mother was praying for me. And despite the fact that heaven was closed, heaven could not refuse her. Heaven could not say no to her. It was my mother. It was the Blessed Virgin Mary. It was her prayers. It was her intercession that brought that angel down in the midst of my suffering. So consider, consider how vital Marian intercession is. Consider how vital Marian devotion is. Consider that when things look dark and black and gloomy and it feels like God is disgusted by me and he has abandoned me and he no longer loves me and demons roam and I feel the heaviness, there is still light in that beautiful feminine mother who prays for us, who intercedes for us, and who heaven cannot ignore. Heaven cannot ignore her. Our lady means everything in heaven. Beautiful picture here from Wayne Weibel's book, Medjugorje, the message. I love this picture. This picture, it was taken um, by, I believe it was a I've heard uh, a couple of stories. I heard priest, I heard sister, but the one that I read was that it was a priest who was um, in the apparition room with the Medjugorje visionaries when they were teenagers. And when they went into ecstasy and had their apparition, he was taking photographs. And later he developed his uh, photographs in Rome. And this image came up, the image of Our Lady's beautiful face and veil, Our Mother, is such a loving intercessor. Our mother brought that angel down from heaven, her prayers, her devotion, her sufferings, her stigmata. The father could not refuse her. So let us, these next few days, this holy week, dear brothers and sisters, let us meditate on how much our Lord and our lady have given us, how much they suffered for us this week. Let us love them, let us console them, let us spend time in silence where we meditate on Jesus in Gethsemane, where we meditate on his blood, sweating blood, when we meditate on him having nothing else left and, and thinking of you, thinking of your name being shown by the angel of light, his beloved ones for whom he is dying, how personal the sacrifice was, how intimate it was. Okay, God bless you all. I love you. Uh, praying for you. You pray for me. Happy Holy Week. Let us always honor our beautiful Lord's blood, our beautiful mother's tears, 
the sacrifice that gives life. God bless you all.